So welcome everybody to Audio MIDI 2. This is Thursday, November the 18th, 2021. And we're deep into the semester. And we've got I've got a lot of stuff planned for today. And I hope that you've all started on your final project. Even if you're just capturing sounds for samples, please do not wait. Please do not wait. Please do not wait till November 3rd, 30th to do your first draft. Please start working on it now. Let me say it one more time. Start working on your project, your final project. I will start grading what you handed in last week. It's been a busy, incredibly busy week for me, um, and I'll get you that stuff as soon as I can. All right, so we're going to continue on with starting off with another study of a different stereo miking technique, and this is called mid-side recording. And let me just open up this session and switch our view. So mid-side recording is the only stereo recording with use that uses two microphones where you do not have to have the same microphone. So in other words, you can have you have to actually have to have two different kinds of microphones or you can use two microphones but they have to be able to have multiple polar patterns so you can use um, you can use an SM57 and you can use a, a condenser mic that has uh, a, a figure eight pattern and let me just take show you a couple of a couple of uh, couple of photos one more time all right so if you notice here I've got two of these 414 mics and I've got one facing I'm, I'm gonna play some uh, get some instruments and I'm this is what I see when I'm seated in the position to be recorded I've got these microphones and they're set up like in, in almost like in a in a T right or a cross right and the microphone that's facing me is set to cardioid so it captures everything in front and this microphone here is set to figure 8 so it's capturing this way and this way and it's not capturing it's capturing very little in front and very little in the back so let's take a look at a few more pictures. You know, notice I don't have it at a perfect 90 degree angle. Just I get it as close as I can. And this is um, a good way to record something in stereo if you don't like for example if you um, are recording an acoustic guitar in stereo right and you put a microphone here and a microphone here when you're listening back in the headphones one microphone is going to is going to capture this that's going to be in one speaker or one of your headphones and then up here is going to be in the other side so it's going to have like you're going to be listening to this thing and you're going to have a, a left it might be the bass or, the, or, or, or it's just it's or the right might be the bass because that's where your right hand is and the left might be the the, the sound on the fretboard and that's that's if it's close mic'd that's okay um, that's a little unnatural to me if you've got a distance away, let's say you're five feet away from the instrument and you bike it like that, then the sound can blend in the with the room and that might work really well. But as far as a close miking technique goes, people do that, right? But it's not what I like myself personally for an acoustic guitar. I like a sound that, that, that I, I actually, 90% of the time, I record my acoustic guitar in mono with just one microphone, and then I double the set. I, I record it again, and I pan left and right. And maybe sometimes on the second one, I play the chords in a different position, right? Uh, so that it's a little different. But basically, 
I, I play the same thing twice and I pan it hard left and right. And then I don't have to worry about phasing issues because it's not the same instrument. It's not the same instrument. And it takes a little bit of work to duplicate what you're playing well enough so that it, it sounds good. But that's sort of how my preferred way of recording uh, acoustic guitar is. Right? But let me play you something. Um, Uh, let's see. Let's go here. Let's do it this way. I wasn't going to, I'm just, this sort of occurred to me just now. So, all right. So I'm going to play you something I recorded for a film. And those of you that took film scoring last night heard this. And I recorded this mid side. And this is just. Last night in class, I said that I had recorded it with one microphone stuck in f by the cone, and I do that most of the time. But then I went back and I looked at my notes in the, my session folder for the score, and I realized I had recorded that mid-side. Um, so another, another funny thing is when I just listened back to that, I was hearing some voices, and there's bleed from the dialogue because I was watching the screen and listening to the um, narration while I was playing, and I could hear the bleed out of my headphones from the dialogue. So... That to me, you know, it, it comes across as being in the center with some space on the side. All right. So what you do is you record the track and th this is the way I've got it labeled here. And let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. So this blue track is the microphone that's facing me. And then I make two tracks, two additional tracks one for the left side and one for the right side. And basically they both have the same input. Right? So let me show you those pictures again. Uh, it's this one here. That's what I always want to see. So the, the cable that comes out of here goes into this, what I call the center. And then there's a cable that comes out of here and gets plugged into the audio interface into tr channel two, but I record it onto two tracks simultaneously. Okay, that's this here. And then what I do is I put in something called a, this, this trim plugin, and that is found in other trim. And actually EQ, uh, one of the EQs that Pro Tools comes with also can work with this. Yes. Okay, let me show you. So, trim, if you look in the upper right, like in the middle on the right, you see that there's a circle with a diagonal line, right? That's fit, That will reverse the... If that's turned on, that will reverse the phase of this track. It won't change the way that the waveform looks. It'll just do it internally, okay? And so basically when the left track is peaking, the right track is doing the opposite. Okay? So you're getting something that's 100 that's completely out of phase. So let me just read you a little bit before I play anything uh, to you. I've got this here, which let me pop this into the class materials uh, so you can get this right here. That's being sent to you so you can download this, but you can read about this anywhere. So this is, you know, this guy, Alan Bloomline, he also has a 
um, a stereo recording technique that he named after him called Bloomline, which is two figure of eight microphones. And he was really, really, he worked for EMI, Abbey Road. And, uh, you know, he, he started this in 1933. That's before anybody really knew much about stereo, right? So, okay, so, right, we, ha we talked last week about the XY, and I played that on the piano. And the main weakness of XY piano technique is that you're stuck with what you've recorded and it's a stereo image. And if you haven't been careful with placing both of those microphones equidistant from the sound source, if you collapse that sound to mono, you can get phase cancellation. MS gives you control over the width of the stereo spread than any other microphone recording technique and allows you to make adjustments after the recording is fi finished. So XY recording requires a matched pair of microphones. It doesn't have to be a matched pair. They just have to be the same model, right? So you could use um, an Audio-Technica 20, two, two Audio-Technica 2020 or 2020 35s. They don't have to be matched. Uh, you could use two, um, they just have to be the same model. It's close enough. It's better if they're matched. Yes, 100%, but it, it sounds fine if it's not matched. They're, they make things very, the tolerance is very close these days. So the mid microphone or the center I'm calling it is set up facing the center of the sound force, sound source. This mic would be cardioid or hypercardioid pattern, although some variations of this technique can use an omni or figure eight, but we're just gonna stick with cardioid or hypercardioid. And the side mic must be a figure eight pattern. This mic is aimed 90 degrees off axis from the sound source. Right, so if this is if I'm the sound source, this is on axis, and that's 90 degrees off axis, like in the image, the pictures I've showed you. So they're using an older version of these of the same microphones I have, like these are from the 60s or the 70s, these gray ones. But basically, it's the same. You see, it's the same technique that I'm using, right? So except that he's got the top one, or this person has the top one facing the drums and the bottom one facing the sides. I don't think that that really matters that much. So the mid microphone acts as the center channel and the side microphone's channel creates ambience and directionality by adding or subtracting information from either side. The side mic's figure eight pattern aimed at 90 degrees from the source picks up ambient and reverberant sound coming from the, both sides of the sound stage. So if you think about it, if you've got a figure eight microphone set up like this, it's capturing all the sound on the left side, my left, and all the sound on my right side, right? It's picking up what's out there. And since it's figure eight pattern, the two sides are 180 degrees out of phase. In other words, a positive charge to one side of the mic's diaphragm creates an equal negative charge to the other side. The front of the mic, which represents the plus side, is usually pointed to the left of the sound stage, while the rear or minus side is pointed to the right. So here we've got an image showing this. So this is our sound source, and this is the microphone that's facing me. And then the blue one is the figure eight. So what you do, it, right, each signal for each microphone is recorded to its own track. However, to hear a proper stereo image when listening to recording, the tracks need to be matrixed and decoded. I like to hear what I'm recording. So my, my method uh, where I record three tracks at once also works. So although you've only you've recorded only two channels of audio, we're recording th I'm recording three tracks. That's just the way I work. I, I skip this step and I go right to hearing it the way it is. The next step is to split the side to signal into two separate channels. This can be done either in your DAW software or hardware mixer by bringing the side signal up on two channels and reversing the phase on one of them. Or you can duplicate, right? So let me show you that um, really quickly. So let's say, for example, let me hide this track. So let me say that I've done this track here, right? I can simply duplicate this track
and then that would be my and I just name it right and just pan it to the right and then I would uh, you know enable the trim the trim with the phase reversal on this one what they're talking about is this uh, let me let me delete this track Th their method of doing it is a little bit more co complicated right so let's say that I pan this back in the center what they're talking about is taking um, two mono augs tracks and then uh, you'd name this one guitar left and then something like guitar right and then you'd set up an input right a bus so we'll do bus 3 and bus 3 the same input and then you'd set the output of this one up to bus 3 and then you'd solo safe this and then that's coming through this channel here and if I reverse the phase on one of these right you're not hearing anything that's because it's panned to the center and I'm gonna go over that in the middle but then if I pan one left and right you're hearing an out of phase stereo image. So this to me is is over overly complicated, right? A lot of extra routing. Easier to just record everything the way that you want it to be. You know what I mean? Just record it you just record the two tracks simultaneously and flip the phase on one. Okay, let's get this back here. Because the front of the mic is facing left, the sound causes a positive polarity. That causes po that positive polarity combines with the positive polarity from the mic, the mid mic in the left channel, resulting in an increased level on the left side of the sound field. Meanwhile, on the right channel of the side mic, that same signal causes an out of phase negative polarity and that negative polarity combines with the mid mic in the right channel resulting in a reduced level on the right side. An instrument positioned 45 degrees to the right creates the opposite effect causing the signal to the right side to increase while decreasing it in the left. Alright, so that's a lot of crazy stuff that is beyond what we teach in this class but let's just talk about the end result. So let me play let me play just the center microphone here. So that's just a blue microphone. So I'm playing similar to the track that you just heard. Okay. So that's that if you guys have your earbuds on, you have the original sound on, you should just hear that right in the center. Right? And um, now if I add the left and the right, listen to the difference in sound. Hmm. What's up with that? Why is there no sound? Yeah, it's in there. Okay. All right. So let's let's do this. I'm going to bring the sound down in the center. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I know what the problem is. I'm not reverse phased. So this stuff is confusing to me too. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. All right. Uh. <laughs> so now we've got this sound here, which is deliciously out of phase. It's so out of phase that if I click on this 
mono button right here, it's going to disappear. So this is going to sum everything into mono. Right? It almost completely disappears. Because the opposites cancel out on each side. Now, let's do this. Oh, I had this in the center still on. That's why it didn't completely cancel out. Okay, so I'm going to start off with just the center channel. And now I'm going to bring up the, fig the two, the left and the right. And you can start hearing it there. Right? You start hearing a little bit of an increased... Uh, sound field and I'll just mute this back and forth and let me bring it up in volume right set no that's just the center channel and that's all three. So I'm using the VCA to control the volume of these two tracks. So let me bring that down. And this way you can control how wide the sound is in stereo. So that's pretty narrow. Right, you can see, or you can hear. center channel so that's the side deliciously out of phase and that's with the center channel backing Now let's listen to like a strummed acoustic guitar and we can see how we'll add some depth to that. Right, so that's mono. Right, I just brought the volume of that up a little bit. Let me do the same to these. All right, so now I'm going to bring up the left and the right. Right? You start hearing the ch tonal change there. Right? That's minus 11.9. Let me turn that up all the way and it'll get really wide. See, that doesn't sound as good to me. I can hear it being a little out of phase, but when you balance it correctly... Right? It's, it's a wider sound. It's really nice. And then if you put a little room on that... Right. So you see how it, how, how narrow it gets when I mute the sides back in.
So for me, if you want to close mic a, a, an acoustic guitar, this is a great option, right? Because it keeps the sound balanced in the middle. I'm not hearing the, up the strings and the body, you know, spread out like this, like a piano um, with a donut hole in the middle, uh, which tends to happen. Everything's perfect phase, right? So let me show you what I mean by that. When I collapse this down to mono by pushing this M, you're going to lose the sides, but you'll still hear the center perfect. So it's in perfect f phase because it's only one microphone that you're hearing. So that if this was being played on a television that was in mono, right, only had one speaker on it, you'd still hear you'd still hear the guitar beautifully. Um, yeah, because you don't have phase issues as long as you've got the, the center channel balanced properly as the dominant sound and some of the side. So if I wanted to just solo the sides, that's the sides, and that's the center. That's the left. And that's the right. It's it's a it's it's like a very big sound. It takes it's just spread out nice and wide. So let's say you're doing a track that's a vocalist or a couple of people singing, acoustic guitar and bass, an upright bass. This would be a great way to like have that acoustic guitar take up a really nice wide spread and be nice and full and nice and balanced. And then you could pan your vocals out. You could have your lead vocal in the middle and then pan out your harmony vocals and make a nice wide sound stage with those and keep the guitar nice and full, but yet in stereo. And then have your bass on the, in the lower end of the frequency spectrum anchoring the center down. So that's a really good um, option. It's not the only option. And, and the thing with all these miking techniques is the more that you know, the better off you'll be because there's no one rule for anything. Sometimes people ask me questions I can't answer because it, it's, it's case dependent. I, I have to know what the end goal is before I can decide on the best miking technique. And, and then I might think miking technique X is really great and then I hear it in context and it's not. have to change. So uh, I, I really hesitate to answer questions like that with a definitive, this is the way you do this. The only thing that's definitive is that for a stereo miking, both microphone capsules have to be, no matter what technique you're using, have to be equidistant from the sound source, right? Uh, well, you saw this, right? They're right next to each other. It doesn't work if one microphone is here and another microphone is here, right? The X, Y, they have to be set up so they're equidistant from the sound source, the same with the ORTF, same with equal spaced, right? There's another one called Bloomline uh, where you've got two figure eights, and I'm going to do this next week, um, a two figure eight microphones set up like this, right? So that they get 360 degrees. It's almost like stereo, but um, an omni-directional signal, but with stereo, uh, with a stereo spread. It's really interesting. So I just wanted to save a different miking technique for next week. And these are the kinds of things that we'd be practicing if we were meeting in person in the studio. And I just want to give you um, a, an a introduction to them. Pete, yes, a Paul. quick question. Mm -hmm. Could you accomplish the same thing using the, uh, for that example, if you did the mono and then double it with another, we play it again? Uh, well, you, it, it's, it's different. I mean, in the first example, it's clear that that would be difficult to just play again and, and right. So, that so, well. so, Paul, yes, I record. I record. Um, hold on, let me just see if I have it on my computer here. Yes, I do. Okay, I'm going to play you something shortly after I get through this. Um, yeah, let me play. I'll play you something where I, I do that. I, I often, Paul, 
Yes, and you won't have to worry about phasing issues if you play the same thing twice with rhythm guitar and pan one hard left and hard right. And then sometimes what I do with that is I actually put in a plug-in that widens the that t throws them a little out of phase and widens the stereo spread of just those two tracks, just a touch to make them seem like they're beyond the speakers, right? And then it gives you a lot of space in the center for the rest of your instruments. So I'll open up a track after I finish this demonstration where I'll show that that uh, technique. Thanks. That that's actually very helpful. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah, that's done all the time. That's like a standard operating technique with electric guitars. And with, um, like, if you listen to a lot of, you know, another way that you can do it, like you can sort of jerry-rig it. Let me just show you that while, I, while I'm here. Let me mute the VCA. And let me take my center, right? And let me pan this to the left. So if you're listening on headphones, this should come out of the left side. Let me turn off the reverb, too. Now, I can make this fake stereo. And how do I do that? Well, if I plug in... Uh, okay, let's see. I, do, 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 do. One mono augs input, and then I'm going to call this uh, delay. And then I'll set up an input for this. So I'll make this bus three. And then I'm going to plug in, or let's say I'll plug in our mod delay three, right? Where is that? Here we go. Mono. And make that 100% and then pan this to the right and then send a copy of the signal to bus three and set this up to like, I don't know, 25 milliseconds. Right, so now you've got kind of like fake stereo. Now the problem with this Let's see what happens if I if I click our um, BX go into mono. No, it still it, it it still works. So sometimes if I'm listening to uh, like stuff recorded in the early '70s, right? So let's say I listen to a Jethro Tull album like Aqualung, and there's a guitar solo. I hear the guitar on the right, and then I hear a very very quick slap delay. This the same guitar on the right. And then that gives you kind of like a big stereo spread that they he didn't play it twice. But now with the all the tracks that you have available to you inside of the DAW, you can play the same part twice and spread it left and right very hard. But this is also a technique that is used occasionally to create like a fake stereo. Uh, I, I let me just see one thing. Let me mute this. Uh, if I I think that it also you can do. Um, mod delay three mono to stereo and then what you would do is um, you would have the right side be dry and then the left side be or the left side be dry and the right side be completely wet so let me just make this uh, 25 milliseconds again oh not 250 25 Right, yeah, so you can do it with that plug-in just like that. That doesn't sound bad, you know? In a pinch, if, you, if you're if you mixing a, a track and you want to get that guitar in stereo and you can't get the person to play again, right, you can do something like that. So basically what's happening is that on the right side, uh, on the left side, you're hearing the acoustic guitar as it's played, and then 25 milliseconds later, on the right side, you're hearing that a, a, a copy of that. So you want, want to make sure that there's no feedback, right? And watch what happens as I turn the, the delay value up. Let me zoom in for this. So right now you see it's on 25 milliseconds. Right, the rhythm gets really sloppy. So if it's at zero milliseconds, it goes back into the center. and about 25, 30 milli, no more than 50 milliseconds. So let's make this 50 milliseconds and that gives you, so like the higher the milliseconds, the wider the spread seems. And then you can actually, let's see what happens if I go up here and I reverse the phase.
doesn't really affect it that much. So that's a kind of like a fake stereo that you can do. So let me. Uh... I heard I've seen people also copy the track like you did, cop make a complete copy and then just slide one right, like correct, 80 correct. ticks. Yeah, correct. That's the same thing as Is that doing, the same effect as doing the delay. Yeah. But then, but but I I don't want you know I if I do it with the delay that that just is a little bit easier for me. Okay, so let's move on to a different instrument. So here I am playing a little melodica, right? That's a keyboard you blow into. And here we are with our. Right. With our stereo, so. Oh, did I turn the. the uh... Okay, why is this no longer working correctly? Did I do something weird? Okay, so with this one, notice how this, this, this makes it a little bit weird for me. It is a little, it is in stereo, but it's not as pronounced as the guitar for some reason. So in other words, if I go here and I pop this into mono, but you can hear a big difference. Again, a good way to make an instrument like this in stereo without having two mics where the low notes are on one side and the high notes are on another side. It's just a nice big stereo field. Um. And it sounds, it sounds good, right? Just recorded right here. No, no big recording studio. in mono it just gets you still hear the nice sound it just the field collapses so there's no phase issues and here we go we can hear the I'll walk back and forth with the microphone here and you can hear it moving from left to right I'm on the left side of the microphone, and now I'm moving around to the center of the microphone, and now I'm sliding over to the right of the microphone, and now I'm on the right of the microphone, and now I'm back to the center of the microphone, and hopefully it went back and forth. Okay. Right, so you can hear that it's in stereo. You can hear it going back and forth between the speakers, but you capture a really nice wide image that does not, that's not, um, you capture a w nice wide image where the sound is balanced differently than if you're using microphones that are pointed in specific areas towards the sound source. All right, so that's mid side, like a primer on mid side. Let me just show Paul this other bit, and it's also for everybody else, it's good. So, no, I don't want to save this. Uh, I've played this for some people before. This is my, um, this is a mix for my FIFA World Cup theme for Fox Sports. And uh, let me find my guitars. All right, so this is my acoustic guitar master. And basically I'm playing the same thing twice. 
So if I split this out into mono, all right, and I mute this. So this is what I played on my left side. And that's what I played on the right side. So I played the same thing twice. And this is actually for, for this kind of a piece of music that I, this, this, tra this song is, this works out much better than playing it and recording it in stereo. And then I did the same thing with the with the electric guitars. Um, let's see, no, those are here. Right, it's the same part played twice on my um, Les Paul. And so that gives you, a, you know, the, you got this big sound, right? So you see how like when all those other instruments are in there in the rhythm section, right? You are, let's see, if I put the drums, when you've got the guitar set up like this, let's mute these other guys. And I'm just gonna solo all the acoustic guitar. Let me turn that up so you hear it a little bit better. So I don't want to play around with my with my automation. So let me just pop in a trim trim tool, and I'll up that volume by about. Right. So you can hear that's the guitar is too loud, but you can hear the guitars on either side, driving the rhythm, and then the percussion's right in the middle, and there is no clash. So that's a great technique with guitars, and you'll see that uh, the bass will come in in a second. And um, right now we got the electric guitar. Again, and I've got the guitars EQ, the electric guitars, so they don't get in the way of the acoustic guitars. Right, so th that's a great technique. Record the same thing twice with guitars and pan one. The same exact thing in pan one, hard left and hard right, and it really, uh, in this kind of a piece of music, it can really help drive the, the rhythm. All right, so that's mid-side recording. Mid-slash-side, mid-dash-side. Let me get a little uh, refreshment here. You know, it can work really well on vo lead vocals too, right? I've been I've produced recording sessions with pop singers where we did mid side with the, with the vocalist, and it's it's it, with the right vocalist and the right track, it can really make that sound big, you know. Especially if there's not a lot of background vocals, um, that's a really great way to add some space to you know have the vocal sound uh, stereo also. Okay, so I want to, um, there's two other topics for today's class. So let's go to stuff. <laughs> All right, so I put together a little something for you guys, and I want to talk a little bit more about some techniques, uh, mixing techniques. So this first bit is just an acoustic uh, electric piano. Just playing some chords, right? So I've got the EQ1 band, and I'm going to put um, a low-pass filter in. 
and I'm going to go here to this little box. I started talking about this a little last week, but we're going to spend a little bit of time on this now. And I've got these smaller examples rather than a huge recording session. So I'm going to, there's the box here that says auto. And right here there's a box and I'm going to click on that, plug in automation, automation enable. And then that gives you a list of what's available to automate. So I'm going to do the frequency and I'm going to add that. And it's going to say OK. All right. And if I go here, this is called the Tracks View Selector. Click on this. You'll notice that at the bottom, right, there is EQ31 band, frequency. That wasn't there before I did the automation. So let me show you. You can also remove automation. So if I go back to the tr notice that's not there anymore. So let me put it back in. Okay. So this is in. And also just so that you know, see this red button? I forget what this is called, but oh, target button. Okay. So if I click on this and turn it off, that means no matter what I do, this plugin will stay open until I manually close it. So in other words, if the, if the target button is on and I click on expand to, notice that the EQ disappears, right? But if I have this on and the target button is turned off, I can do that and it stays. Now, remember we did this automation last semester, those of you that took Audio MIDI 1, we did automation in MIDI by right clicking here and we figured out what MIDI CC, so in other words, there's a cutoff filter, right? MIDI CC 74, we open up our MIDI editor and we go here and we want to add a controller, right? And we remember we did this last semester, so we wanted to go to 74, right? It gives you a list here and 74. Oops, we could add that in. And now that becomes available to automate here. So let's do this. Let me open up Expand. Let me leave this open. And let's do our MIDI editor down here this time. And we'll go to 74. Right, and I can automate this with the pencil tool like this. And you see the cutoff filter is moving. Right, so we did this in MIDI. We've done this in MIDI, so this should be fairly easy for you guys to pick up. But what I'd like to do today is, you know, show you some creative uses. Uh, let's do this. Right, and remember we, there, there were other shapes that we could do, so we could do square, and we could set this up to eighth notes, and then we could have uh, like a tremolo effect with our volume. Right, that's drastic. You could, you know, you could do it so that it's just a little bit. Oh, actually, I want to start in the middle. Right, so it's just a, well, maybe a little bit more than that. Mm, more than that. It's so subtle. I guess it's all or nothing. Not a great filter on this. <laughs> really, it's, it's you're gonna have all or nothing? Isn't that a tune? So, okay, that's, we did that in MIDI. That's all MIDI. Um, we're going to now, let me make sure that that's gone. Yeah. We're going to do that with our EQ. So I'm going to add 
frequency. Hit this, make sure we got a low pass. And then now we do it up here in the track view selector. Frequency. And then notice once I've done that, it'll open right to it. So I can do something similar as I did with the filter with this. So I can start off and do something like this. Right? So you can do something subtle like this. Right, so that you can hear much more easily. Correct, that's true, Claudia. It's easier to see if you expand the window out. So you notice that this one is a little bit easier to hear because this filter is better than what's built into expand. And then what's cool is that once you get something you like, right, you can highlight this and use Command D and just duplicate that out. So that's kind of cool, right? And then you could do something subtle or something that takes longer to unfold. You can also use the random shape here, right? And this is like, it looks like a city skyline. So let's listen to this. And I've got it set to 16th notes, right? And it almost sounds like what's called sample and hold. It's very random. And let me speed up the tempo. Let's do like 120 beats per minute. To continue on with film scoring last night, you can't notate that on uh, Sibelius or Finale or Dorico, <laughs> right? So that's kind of cool. That's the random. And this has square and triangle, and we've played around with those in Audio MIDI 1. But again, this is at the rhythmic value of 240. And you can um, use the trim tool and bring everything down. And you get a nice rhythmic. So this is how you can add rhythm, some, some interesting rhythmic vitality to your tracks, you know, by playing around with this kind of automation. That reminds me that uh, there's something, a side chain I promised to teach you guys, which I didn't get to. I should remember to do that next week. I have something prepared for that. I could actually do something like that now. Um, let, let me think about that while I'm continuing on with this stuff. All right, so we've, we can, I can still automate that. Now, I tell you guys, right, that <clears throat> I want you to use time-based effects like reverb and delay as a send into an AUGS input. And you guys have all got that pretty much. Everybody I think I've seen do that. I think you understand how to do that. There are times where putting a reverb or a delay, an echo, into a track works better than 
having it as a send. And one is where you're, you're having a specific effect for a specific sound. And you're going to automate that. And that's, that effect is only going to be for that sound. And then you would use the mix control on the effect to put in the amount of that effect. So let's take a look at that. So first thing we'll do is we'll do, um, we'll do mod delay three. And, you know, no matter what company's presets, they all have this auto button. Right, so if you have something from Waves, or UA, or Sound Toys, or anything, they all have the they all have parameters that are automatable. And to be honest with you, Expand Two also has those kinds of, you know, look at this much 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 more intensive automation parameters here that you could play around with on the audio track than on MIDI tracks. Right, so this is just. You know, you could experiment around with this stuff for six months before you start wrapping your head around all the possibilities with automation, but it's good to get started. And what automation does, in a nutshell, is it adds animation to your mixes. And animation and motion is a great way to take a static sound and give it humanity, give it interest. Because, as I've said before, you know, if I'm playing this, if I'm playing this slide guitar, I got my finger in this in this brass thing, and and I'm doing stuff as the sound is unfolding. You know, um, if Andy's playing his trumpet, he can do all sorts of effects with his lips. He can put his hand in front of the bell and make a like a faux wah wah effect. He can do all sorts of stuff. Anybody, um, Jin if she's singing. You could do all sorts of stuff with your voice. Well, this is just a static sound. I mean, there is some motion going on there because there's uh, some chorusing and there's a little tremolo, but it's just a sound, right? And what I did before with the filter, well, like with the, let's let's do that, go back to that. To this bit, and we're using the triangle. So let's make this um, let's make this half notes, right? And go back to our pencil. Right. So I'm adding some. I'm adding some motion to that sound, some animation. And you have to experiment around with this stuff and develop an aesthetic and taste and understand when it's too much, right? When it's too much. You want to understand what the function is, what you're trying to do, and just determine how much of these kinds of things you want to have in your track. And to do that, you have to understand what effect you're trying to achieve. So for me, let's say I wanted just a little subtle timbral change, right? I, I might do something where it's, I keep the amount tiny, like this. Right, and it's tiny, it just adds a little subtle. Almost, almost imperceptible, but it's there. Or I can do something that's a little bit more drastic. You have to understand what your function is. There's no one use case, right? Um, we're going over all the techniques. This is where your artistic aesthetic, your vision comes into play. And what you want to do is you want to start listening to music and seeing like, where is this being done? You know, and how are other people using it? And then experiment around and come up with your own aesthetic. But what I would caution you all to do is to start off subtle and learn how to do that subtle so it works really well and then start getting more and more animated with the animation and the automation. Just like I counseled all of you when you're adding reverb to not over reverb and every one of you 
listened. And all on all the projects I've heard so far, the reverbs sound really well. Once you understand that and you get that, and then you want to add more reverb, then you'll under, you'll be able to do that with more confidence because you know when it's too much because you've been sort of just subtly adding it and getting used to doing that and getting used to how adding reverb to a sound changes the, 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 the timbre of the sound, changes the way it's spaced, placed in space and all of that stuff. Okay, so I'm getting a little, uh, yes. Um, not that often, but I do use it, right? It's a special effect. I do use it, but not not often. But I I'm going to show you something I'm working on. Uh, I I I finished mixing yesterday, and I showed this to my filmmaking class last night. I'm going to show you guys that, and the, and those of you that took film make film scoring, uh, you'll get a a rehash of that. But that's uh, you know in like half an hour. Let's continue on here. Okay, um, okay. So we've got mod delay three, right? So. What we have right here, these amber triangles, this is the percentage of dry and wet for each side. So let me bring this down so that it's completely dry on both sides. And when I play the sound, you're not hearing any delay. And now you're hearing a little delay in the left. And now you're hearing right. The right side is completely wet and the left side is completely dry. Now, if you have a sound that's completely wet, remember that you won't be hearing it on the downbeat. You won't be hearing it on the beat. You'll be hearing only the echo, which happens at a different spot in the timeline. Okay, so typically, like if you had a guitar pedal, you'd have the... All right, let me turn the feedback up a little bit so we can hear more of the echoes. Right, you're, right, you can clearly hear the echo there. So if I were to just play that. And so if I do this, the draw, you'll hear on the left side of your headphones, you'll hear a dry sound. And on the right side, you're going to hear a lot of delay. So that's kind of cool. You can sort of make a faux stereo out of that right like we did with the acoustic guitar so but what we'll do here is we will do um, a very spacious reverb so we'll do a, a half note and a dotted quarter note right and let's just let's listen to um, let's listen to what the half note sounds like right so I'll play the note Okay, and now let's listen to what the quarter dotted chord note and then the two together. Okay, so let's go to our automation. We've got that, I got that, I like that. Right, so see how that adds rhythm to a stat to a like a whole note. All right, so let's go to our automation, and we're going to look for the wet dry mix. Mix left. Mix right. I'm going to add those in and notice look at look at the look at what it looks like now you see that there's green box wrapped around there that lets you know that those are automatable right they got a little green light around the perimeter so that's pretty cool you can take a look at that and know hey there's automation there I set that up so we'll have that box here mix left so let's have this work out so that with our we we'll use a line and we'll have this the, the sound gradually come in over time and we'll get up to like 57 and then mix right 
actually let, let me show you something let me uh, let me think about this a little differently so we're going to have um our the left come in quicker and then go to the right and have that come in later and let's get this down here so let's take a listen and then you could see your automation lanes down here uh, so you could go back to the clips and you could add another one yeah there we go and then let's get our mod delay open and let's play this and listen to what happens our dry sound starting to hear the reverb the, the delay Ah, the right side is coming in now. One more time without me talking. And then what you can also do is you can change the timbre of the delay. So right now when I play this, you see that every, every echo has the exact same tone as the original piano sound. What happens if we use our low pass filter and we bring this down? Right? And then we play. It gets darker as it repeats. So let's add a little bit more feedback for right now so we get a little bit more. See, it's getting darker. The sound is getting darker as it more down the line you get with your feedback. It gets darker and darker. So we can automate that. So we go low pass filter left, and then LPF right. We can add those in. Low pass filter left, low pass filter right. OK, and then we can make these so that as it goes on, it gets darker and darker. And then this one starts later, right? So let's listen to that now. Here we go. Let's turn the feedback up a little bit more. This will make it a little bit muddier, but I think it'll make it a little bit more uh, obvious. And you could see that this has the green line around it also, around the perimeter. One more time. right that's cool and then now we can go back to our one band EQ and we can do our frequency and let's do that random bit and we'll make the random bit be 16th notes and I'll make it a little bit more dramatic this time by right by making the 
that longer. So now let's take a listen to this. All right. So I think that's pretty cool myself. I try to use it, but then I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I like that. Right. So, you know, it's you, you got to play around with it. And what I would say, uh, Claudia, is to play around with the rhythmic value of your grid. Right. You might like it better if it's a larger rhythmic value, like an eighth note or, or, or a quarter note. Or you like, might like it better if it's a faster rhythmic value. And then the thing is that if you do it just subtly, like let's say like that, let me turn up the tempo also. So it's just doing a little bit. So let's get rid of all that. And you notice that it turns amber when there's information, right? There's no information anymore, so it's not amber. And let's close this and go back to clips. And make sure you always go back to clips when you're done, all right? Okay, so here I've got this nylon string guitar. So what if I want to make it sound like somebody's further away and they're coming closer to me as or I'm getting closer to them as they're playing. Let's see if we can achieve that effect. So that would be reverb. So let me find, I'll put in D verb, which again, uh, not my favorite. And let's just go to uh, a dark small church. Now, let's take a listen to this. It's going to be really swimmy. So there's two parameters that we can animate, that we can automate, right? It could either be the decay time or the mix. So let's add both of those in so we can play around with it. So uh, the wet dry and decay. So let's try first with the wet dry. So we're going to start off completely wet and we're going to go to our line and we're going to make it drier as we get closer. Right, so that's that's a you know that, that's okay. I, I'd say that that's passable. I don't know how great it is. Let's undo that, and let's get um, a nice mix so that we're here. It's not completely swimming. And let's play around with our decay time. All right, so we got that at six point three seconds. That's pretty big. So let's do the same thing to decay. I like this a little better.
Now let's do a combination of decay and wet dry. So we'll start off pretty wet and we'll get pretty dry. Okay, that's better. It's still one, one element, right? Because it's the same volume all the way through, even though we're changing the volume of the effect. So the next thing I would do would be to go to volume, and I would make it get louder as it got closer. So now let's take a listen. Right? Really far away. So I was taking notes as I was creating that effect, right? I was seeing what each little bit did, and then what else happens? Well, when somebody's further away, not only is there more re less more reverb, but the sound will be softer, on a, especially on a guitar. And as you get closer, the sound will be louder. So I thought about how, in reality, that would actually happen, and then use the technology automation to make that happen, right? So that's pretty cool. So that's nice, right? And notice it's got a mix. With the mix all the way up, you don't hear anything because Chorusing is like a delay uh, with module, you know, and puts things out of phase a little bit. Um, but if all you're hearing is the chorus sound, you're not hearing the original that is creating the rub, that it's creating the rub with. Now, you've got depth, right? So that's kind of cool and you've got Raid. So let's see if we can, if we can do some cool stuff. So let's go to, um, let's go to a, a slow stereo, all right? And I'll bypass it. Right? So let's go here and let's automate our rate and depth. That must be depth. <laughs> Why can't they write the word depth? Are they too lazy? Oh, Avid. Depth. Is that like Johnny Depp? Okay, so let's do something where the rate is going to increase and then decrease. And I'm just drawing something and I'm going to listen. So it's too fast, right? So I think what, what would be kind of cool would be to have it nothing and then have it come in faster to a, at a certain, so in other words, the rate is really slow and then it comes into a, a moderate rate and then it stays there. So the sound is transforming as you're playing it. <laughs> okay, now let's play around with our, our depth. And I'm going to exaggerate this so you can see what it does.
Right? You can clearly hear that it's too much. Well, if you like to have weird music, it's not too much. But having it come in to like a moderate amount, and maybe it doesn't, it starts like after the, somewhere in the middle, right? It doesn't start right at the beginning. It, it plays normally. you're starting to hear it, right? So it's nice. That could come in, let's say, in the chorus of a song. You know, you keep it clean on the first verse, and then this effect comes in on the chorus. So that's kind of cool. So what else can we do? Well, let's play around with the pre-delay, see what that does. Let's go here. So it's only 24 milliseconds. The pre-delay is how long until the chorusing effect comes in, right? So 24 milliseconds is not, not a long time. So you, you really don't hear a great distinction. But you do hear a little bit. That's the clean. So you could have the pre-delay. We, we can automate that. and have the pre-delay get more intense as the track moves on. You can almost hear like it's a double attack, very slight. Now, and then what we can kind of do that's kind of cool is we can take our um, mod delay three, right? And we could set this to be a, like zero uh, on one side and um, 50 on the other side. And, or we can keep this completely dry and then we can automate the wet on the right, mix right. Okay, so watch, this is kind of cool. So I can make this be fake stereo as the song progresses. Right, you're hearing it right in the middle. You're hearing the chorus coming in a little? Still mono. And then the delay is making it wider. That's using the same principle that I used earlier on the solo acoustic guitar where I put it through a mono to stereo delay and had one side be delayed by 50, by 50 milliseconds. You were hearing each side at a different time. One immediately, and then the second one 50 milliseconds later. Okay? All right, cool. All right, so I've got a little thing here.
So um, I want to talk f for a couple things here. I want to uh, talk to you more about the lists. Right. Last week, I went over the tracks list and I showed you what those little icons were. We, we know a little bit about the groups list, right? We've been making groups and telling you how to activate and deactivate them. But I haven't really talked about the clips list, which is this one on the, on the right here. So this clips list is, uh, let, me, let me get everything visible and all to our uh, waveform or clips. Right, so if I were to highlight any of these tracks, you'll notice that this gets gray here, right? So that's the clip. I can take that and drag it in there, right? So this is EP01. If I delete this, it's still there. I haven't deleted it from the session. So, oh, where did that go? Well, I can always just drag it back in there. Okay. And again, over here, you can tell th the kind of track it is, the kind of clip it is, because this one has a little DIN, MIDI. That's the icon there, the circle with the five dots in it. That's a DIN pin, a DIN connector that is a standard MIDI connector. And then up here, you've got a little waveform. Then you notice that this one has a triangle and this one doesn't, right? The triangle means that it's a stereo track. And if you click here, you'll see the left and the right. So what's cool about that is you can, um, if I take this and drag it here, right? I've got just the right side of that if I want that. Or I could do the same with the left. And again, E guitar dash one. If I delete this, it's not really gone. It's just off the timeline. It's here. And I it's supposed to be at measure 41. So I haven't taught this much, but there's this mode up here called spot. And spot is not a little white dog with a black spot. Uh, C spot run, which probably none of you, only Paul has probably read that book because it was a reading primer when we were children. So I want to put that on measure 41. So I've got this highlighted, and it's going to go on to this electric guitar track here. So if I just drag this down into this area, another pop-up window is going to come up. Spot dialog. So the time scale is bars and beats, right? And I'm going to type in 41. And then I'm going to hit OK and then it's placed it right where it's supposed to be. So spot is a really helpful, especially if you're doing film work, for placing things in the exact spot it needs to be. Okay, so right here at the end, I made a mistake on the guitar. So I'm playing an E minor chord, and the bass is hitting a D. So I want to fix that, right? So I'm going to punch in. Now, one thing about punching in is that you want to make sure when you're recording, you always want to start, you always want to start recording before you actually want to come in because you don't want to clip off the transient or the beginning of your performance. Right? That's why some of you were recording, a couple of people I saw on the last assignment, they started their sessions at one and they started recording audio at one and the beginning, the very first note was chopped off because they came in early. And that's why I taught, I've taught you guys how to do the leader track where you um, time operations and you move the song start 
and bars and beats and renum remove the start to three and renumber it as one, right? I taught you guys that. And this way you have two bars up front. So if you come in a little early, you're not clipping the beginning of your audio file. So, and then the other thing that you have to remember is that right now I've got these drums being played by boom and it's a loop, right? So if I start, let's say I'm in slip mode and I start right here. Right? You're really fortunate that boom keeps things lined up. There are some things that play back when there's a loop playing and you start not on a solid beat where it starts playing from that in-between spot as the first beat and everything is not lined up. So that's just something you have to be aware of that might happen. But here we don't seem to have that problem with boom. Actually for a very old piece of software, boom is very usable. Uh, I, the sounds are really good for, in that style. They don't sound like a real drum kit, but they do sound like drum machine. I just wish that they would have separate outputs for each one of these sounds and that you could drag a sample onto this little tab here and replace these sounds with your own samples. And I've let Avid know about that. I had a nice little email exchange <laughs> this week professing my not love for Apple. I mean for Avid. Okay, so I want to replace this guy here, right? So I'm going to start right here at measure 49 and I'm going to go up to this area here and I, we've gone over this a little bit before and I'm going to click on pre-roll and I've got it set up for two measures and that means that my playback hat is at measure 49 it's going to start playing back at measure 47 and then if I had this record enabled it would punch in the recording at measure 49 so what I'm going to do is I'm going to record enable and hopefully this guitar is still in tune. And I've got this guitar set up. I've got it just directly in to my audio interface here. And I'm using, I'll show you the plugin I'm using in a minute. All right, so I got to practice along. So I'm going to input enable, which is that green eye. Right, so let's see. Three. Okay, one take. So if we listen to this, we're gonna hear that I've clipped the beginning of it. Wait, wait till we get here. You hear that little click, right? If I turn off the pre-roll and go into slip mode, there's a little click, right, when it Right, because you could see that there's a little schmutz there. It doesn't match up. There's a click. So, this original clip has not been lost or erased. You can use the trimmer tool and just grab this, slide this back like that. And you've got perfect, right? Right, so I recorded this whole bit here, but there's a little clicking because I came in a little bit early on my first take and then I came in a little bit early on my second take but it didn't start recording until after see you see that it's eh it's not plamp it's eh like in other words you're not hearing the pick go across the strings because I'm a little early on the guitar and this is what I was talking about you're not hearing you're hearing eh but you're not hearing the, the strum across the strings so I want to fix that and the way that I fix that is I just take my trimmer tool and I just find an empty spot right in between and then that's the original take and it goes to the second. Boom. Okay. Now let me show you something else real quick today too. Playlists. Now there's many ways of doing playlists right but um, and I'm going to show you actually two things. So I can make, click right here by this downward facing triangle. 
and I want a new playlist and I'm going to title this e-guitar and I'll just write take two and see how that disappeared and notice that like to the right of the name there's a blue this box is now blue which means that there's there are alternate playlists so if I want to get the other one back I just select it right here and boom it comes back so I'm going to start a little early here, one measure early, and I'm going to record a new guitar track. All right? Okay, so I recorded a track. And what if I want to build an arrangement, right? I like the first half and of this one, and I like the second half of the other one, right? So let me go to grid mode. And there's, there's a couple of ways that you can do this, right? Um, but let me just show you this way. It's, it's easy. So go back to the other one. And I like the second half of this one. So I'm going to copy. I'm going to select this and copy this. And while that is still highlighted, go back to this playlist and just paste it in there. And then now I've got... And I might have to do some cleanup. So this this works particularly well if you're just you know you're just recording and you're figuring out different takes. I'm going to go more over this next week because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ways to do playlisting and and to comp tracks together and everything. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to that. So let me do that. Uh, let, let me go over that procedure again. So what I did was I right clicked here on this little triangle and I made a new playlist and I'm gonna call this one take three this way I could take uh, and, and you'll notice that um, it's up here right so the oh, that's another thing I should tell you is that there notice that there's two colors the dark color is the unedited take and then the the, the, the not highlighted or the bold is the unedited take and then the the dark one, the lighter one, is the edited take. So in other words, if I go back here to take two, right, and I click here, see that's this one. And then, um, and then that's this one, right? See that? If I click on this one, it, it, this, is the, this is this particular click and then this is this particular clip. So they're not bold. So that's how you could sort of manage your data. So take three. So I'm going to do a completely different take and then I will comp together all three. Like that. Okay, doofy. It's the kind of it's like stunod guitar playing. So what I want to do is I want to take the first two, the first measure or two. So I'm going to just go go back to grid mode, 
just like this. Two measures, I'm gonna copy that and then I'll go back to my previous take and paste that in and now I've got uh, more of an arranged guitar part. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? We're gonna do some more, I'm gonna show you some more stuff today, but the next thing I wanna show you is that, let's say I want Jin Hee to come up with a vocal line on this, right? And let's say that Jin Hee is working in Logic Pro, right? She's a friend of mine, and this you're outside of class, and you've done this in Pro Tools, but your friend works in Logic Pro. And we went over this a little bit. Or even if you just want your friend in our class to play, to sing, or somebody, Michael, who's not here today, wants to play saxophone, um, how does that work? Um, okay. What I would say is that you want to send them audio files only. So we've gone over this before. So I'm going to highlight these two tracks. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to. Well, first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to save this session as, right, stuff, I called it stuff, um, for collab, right, for collaboration. Okay. So I'm going to uh, commit, right, and then I'll do, no do nothing with those tracks. Okay, so, and then next thing is bass, so I need to commit that. All right, so I've got these four audio tracks right here. Oh, the other thing we need to do is if you're sending something to somebody in Pro Tools and you're going to send them a session, right? Excuse me. Let's say, I, right, what you, there's two ways of going about this. So if I, these are, I, these are my four tracks that I want to send. You go to Export. Selected, we've gone over this once before. Selected tracks as new session, right? Selected tracks as new session. So I've selected these four audio tracks. I'm going to solo these right now. So these are just audio. So if you're sending this to somebody in Pro Tools, right, you can select the tracks that you've bounced and rendered as audio. Uh, export selected tracks as new session. Important, important, very important, very, very important. Items to copy, audio files. Make sure that that's clicked. Copy the audio. Because if you don't copy the audio, it's they're going to get blank clips with no, um, with no data because the audio files are on your computer, not in the session folder, in the audio files folder. So we're going to click OK. Selected tracks only, audio files. Click OK. And then navigate. So stuff for collab. Uh, I would probably mm, title this export. Just try it. So this will then save it. And then let me uh, close this. And then right now, you s then what you would do is you would compress this, upload it to Dropbox, tell the person, hey, just jam on this, make add me a couple of little vocal tracks, like and I'll and then I'll edit together something, draw me a couple of ideas, make playlists, right, and then I'll edit something together, and then but you, you would send them this zip thing. 
and then they would get it into their computer. And if they had Pro Tools, right, they would open it up and boom, you only have those four tracks. Nothing else. And then they could add, you know, a couple of vocal tracks and, and then send, send then they could send this back to you, this session. And they could send, like, you could, you would have to save it as, let's say, maybe version two or something like that. And then they would know that it was, had the stuff that you want, that they wanted uh, added. Okay. So that's, that's, you know, talking about collaborating, collaborating. Now, let me go back. Let's say that this was the other track and we, um, want our friend who plays in Logic. Notice that all these tracks are different lengths. What you want to do is you want to highlight these tracks and make them all have the same start point and the same length. So I've highlighted them I, and then I've done Command E to separate out so that I've just got this one area here and then I'm going to make these all, uh, I'm going to re uh, heal all of these. So that's Option Shift 3. Okay, and these are highlighted and we've done this before with uh, exporting our structure files. Option Shift K, or no, it's Command Shift K. Right, we're going to export these selected clips as audio files. And I'm going to choose my destination directory and it's going to be on my desktop. And I'm going to open that and I'm going to make a new folder and then this will be stuff, stems, and I'm going to put the tempo in this, in this thing. And this is 86 beats per minute. Okay. Open up. And then I'm going to export. And then let's say I'm opening this up in Logic. So I'm, I'm going to do it in Pro Tools, but just imagine that it's Logic or it's even GarageBand. And I'll call this a Stuff Overdub. And then I'm going to import my audio. Uh, wrong one. There's stuff stems. Here we go. I'm going to select all of these and I'm going to copy them. Remember, copy, copy, copy. And then get our tempo, 86. There you go. And they could um, now if they recorded some new stuff in Logic or a different DAW, they have to make their audio files be the same length as these, and only and healed so that it's one co continuous file. It's not a bunch of little takes put together, right? So what I did to the guitar take, they have to do in their DAW, and they should know how to do that. 